Throughout the annals of British comedy, one man stands out for being one of the most prolific, influential and popular entertainers of all time. Bob Monkhouse was a writer, actor, presenter, entertainer and one of the sharpest minds ever to grace British comedy. I'm Colin Edmonds and for over 50 years I wrote for Bob Monkhouse, lastly becoming his lead joke writer and programme consultant. Now to mark the 20th anniversary of his death, with the help of the wonderful Harriet Thorpe, Beyond the Title celebrates the man of a million jokes and examines the legacy of one of the very few comedians to ever earn the status of comedy genius. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's remember the one and only Bob Monkhouse. Hi, and a very happy new year to the Beyond the Title audience, and I hope 2024 brings you health, happiness and success. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this incredibly special edition of Beyond the Title. The Sherlocks among you may have already realised that I am not Josh Barry. For those of you who haven't realised that yet, then you either need to get your hearing checked or get out the bath. I am the star of Stage and Screen I didn't write this. Harriet Thorpe. And for this podcast, I'm going to be Josh's voice and speak his words about his comedy hero, inspiration and idol. If you've listened to Josh's podcast with Ian Lee on Television Centre, then this follows a similar structure. The 27th of December 2023 marked the 20th anniversary of a momentous moment in the history of British entertainment. The sad death of a comedy pioneer, a TV icon, and one of the sharpest minds ever to grace the British television. And that's not three people. There are just a handful of stars who, only by the very mention of their name, have their ability to excite an audience. In the case of our subject, I think it's partly the smacking of the syllables. Bob Monkhouse! You can really accentuate the consonants so that MC would find it very satisfying to announce his name. And beyond that, they were excited because they knew they were about to witness a performance right at the very top of his game. You felt safe watching him. Because for most of us, he'd be a constant face on our television screens for all our lives. Bob Monkhouse was a star from the TV variety days of the early 50s to the multi-channeled landscape of the new millennium, always embracing new fads, fashions and stars of entertainment. Monkhouse totally epitomized everything I love about comedy that remains arguably one of the most important and influential figures in post-war entertainment. In a moment, I'm going to tell you why I believe that Monkhouse is so very important to the history of British comedy and light entertainment. But first, here's some famous fans and colleagues who wanted to add their own contribution to this very special Bob Monkhouse celebration and remind us all why he is so significant to his industry. Here's the legendary Jimmy Tarbuck, Ben Elton, Billy Pearce, Graham McCann, Jeff Stevenson and Geoffrey Holland to pay their own tribute to this comedy great. Well, I thought Bob Monkhouse was unique and the best quiz show host that has ever been on British television and I was a big fan. Bob Monkhouse was a massively important figure in British stand-up. Above all, as a master himself, disguising wickedly subversive riffs under his beguilingly smooth delivery, but also as one of the greatest comedy fans there ever was, creating a massive, unique and now essential archive dedicated to the craft he loved. I had the pleasure of meeting him once or twice, and he was a truly kind and lovely man. His incredible enthusiasm for all things comedy was exhilarating to be around. Hello there, my name's Billy Pierce. I'm a comedian from the north of England and my memories of Bob Monkhouse are, well, first of all I grew up with Bob Monkhouse, watching him on the telly and admiring him greatly from a long, long distance. 
But my best memory ever, as my career started to take off and I did various lovely things, um, I was doing a charity show down south. I only go down there on missionary work. And there was lots of famous people on the bill, including Mr Bob Monkhouse, uh, Ronnie Corby, uh, Fr Frank Carson was there, and uh, Jimmy Tarbuck and Frank Bruno. And I was walking down the corridor at the back of the stage and uh, as I walked down the corridor, coming towards me was uh, Bob Monkhouse. And I kind of put my head down because I, I was in awe of him. And also, I didn't want to be sycophantic and all that. But as I walked towards him, he called my name out and said, Billy Pierce. And I, threw, I said, hello, Mr Monkhouse. He said, can I just tell you, he said, I thought your show on New Faces, which I was on in 1986, he said, was absolutely great. He said, I love the gag where you did this and the gag where you did that. And he started re reeling off what I'd done on the show. And then he said, and I loved how you did the song that got higher and higher and it was in the wrong key for you. And he was complimentary and shook my hand. And my estimation of Mr Bob Monkhouse went stratospheric. He was a wonderful, kind, generous, encyclopedic man and very, very sadly missed. Thank you for inviting me to comment on Mr Monkhouse. When, after the war, Bob Monkhouse went for an audition at the BBC in front of the producer Dennis Main Wilson, he had such a positive impact that Dennis Main Wilson scored him 101%. And underneath, he put the simple one word exclamation wow. And it's tempting today, looking back over his career and his many achievements, to use that same word wow, because he did have the wow factor as an individual. He was remarkably talented very versatile and unusually intelligent as a comic performer and personality. He was a very gifted writer, not just in terms of styling material for himself, but also he had the gift of tailoring material and ideas for a wide range of other comic personalities. He was a fine comic performer in his own right and an occasional actor, he was even a gifted cartoonist and he also pioneered the idea of comic personalities becoming hosts of quiz shows and game shows, something that's very common today, but something that Monkhouse really showed the way for in terms of how a comedian could take control of such a show and make it appealing to a broader range of people. I think of all the things that he did, the things that showed an insight into the man as well as the performer was when he had a BBC show that acted as a kind of showcase for many other comic performers. And in that show, he demonstrated what a great audience he was for other comic performers, something that's quite rare in terms of the profession. Uh, he was very supportive and very effective in terms of making them look really good. And... That was very much what he was like in real life off stage. He was very kind, very thoughtful, very generous, very supportive, a great appreciator of other people's talents and a great champion of their cause when they needed it. And I think for that reason and also for his achievements as a comic performer, a fine stand-up, a great writer... He deserves today just that word, wow, because he was one of the greats in terms of British entertainment. I grew up watching Bob and uh, absolutely idolised him as a kid. There was a few comics like Bob and uh, Bruce Forsyth, uh, Jimmy Tarbutt, Dickie Anderson. They were all greats to me. Uh, and um, so when I came into the business, um, I was uh, I started off doing uh, lots of TV warm-ups for the big shows. And um, one night, I was at TV Centre, and two friends of mine, uh, Terry and Wally Mardell, who were uh, brothers, and they were also uh, a comedy double act, but they also um, got in, they, they got a company together uh, that um, would come up with ideas for game shows. And uh, one of their uh, shows was Bob's Full House. So... Um, 
I was in the studios, I can't remember, I think I was doing Terry and June, and uh, I'm having a cup of coffee, and I saw Terry, Terry Mardell, and he said, Jeff, he said, uh, come down and meet Bob. I said, Bob who? He said, Bob Monkhouse. I said, you're joking. I said, he, he said, I said, I've never met him before. I don't know him. He said, come down. He'd love to meet you. So I go down with uh, Terry and uh, walk into this hospitality room. And there's Bob. And uh, Terry said, oh, Bob, this is Jeff Steve. And immediately as he said that, Bob said, you don't need to tell me who this is. He said, how are you, Jeff? He said, I've been watching your work for a long time now, or for what seemed like a long time, uh, for the last few years. And he started reeling off all these shows that I'd done, which wasn't that many uh, at the time. And he would even remember jokes and bits of material that I did. And I was just absolutely blown away. And everybody said it, his memory was fantastic. And yes, it was. Uh, so f from then on, um, if ever I was in a studio and Bob was there, I would always get to chat to him. And he was just so lovely, so nice, always interested in what you were doing and gave me uh, loads and loads of encouragement. And um, yeah, I miss him. He was, uh, he was a good guy, he was a great comic, and he loved comedy. And um, there's not much more you can say about, about Bob, really. It's, well, there's nothing bad you can say. He was just unbelievable. So uh, yeah, I hope this, um, this reflects how I feel about Bob and how I know so many do as well. Hello, Josh. It's Jeffrey Holden here with my thoughts on Bob Monkhouse. Um, Bob was a, a fantastic man, and he's a great loss to show business. I mean, not only did he sing the the song title to You Rang Me Lord with Paul Shane, uh, which was marvellous for us to have him there, he was one of the nicest men I think we've ever come across in this business. He was very, very sincere. Uh, and his knowledge of vintage comedy was second to none. His his archive of silent movies from when he'd gone was was extraordinary. The find there, uh, and he was one of the nicest men I've ever worked with. I did a. a of celebrity squares with him, but of course, throughout his career and my career, you know, we both met several times on occasions, uh, and you know, the business will greatly miss him. He was an expert at the craft of presenting a quiz show, he was the master of the game show, uh, and uh, I shall always remember him for that. Well, a big thank you to those wonderful people for their contributions. I really can't believe we got those great and talented individuals to wax lyrical about Bob exclusively for this Beyond the Title tribute. But that really tells you a great deal about the man who we're celebrating. He was loved by the whole industry, adored by his contemporaries and admired by succeeding generations. I don't think I've ever met a comedian who hasn't acknowledged him as one of the greats either as a personal inspiration or just an ever-present figure within the industry. Comedians right across the board cite him as one of the most influential entertainments in the profession. And that can't be just a coincidence. So what do I think? Well, for me, Bob Monkhouse always embodied that British shiny floor entertainment which has become part of our national identity. We're not talking about the usual features of British comedy. He wasn't a sitcom actor, nor a universally celebrated as Morecambe and Wise. In fact, when I'm asked to select my favourite comedian, people often reply, why Bob Monkhouse? The game show host. It really pains me that he isn't as fondly remembered with the public as Eric and Ernie, because to me, they're on an equal footing. Monkhouse was the epitome of quintessential, big-budget, British-variety entertainment at its very best and never shortchanged its audience. To me, he was the perfect definition of the British front-of-cloth comedian and I can't think of a bigger and better compliment. Growing up in the 90s, when television benefited from the hangover of Thatcherism, light entertainment had the financial backing to be creative with programme making. This was a period when there was serious amounts of money being ploughed into television and light entertainment 
and it benefited greatly. The colourful sets, memorable scene music, games, big stars and a commanding host were all vital components to a successful family ratings winner. Whether it was Noel, Bruce or Scylla, these were the ratings equivalent of Viagra and helped to recrown Saturday night as the biggest TV night of the week. But only one man never failed to capture my imagination and change my whole life without ever knowing me. If Bob was around today, I think he possibly might have had his own podcast simply because he absolutely loved discussing comedy with fellow comedians. After all, he was a fantastic interviewer himself, which he displayed many times over the years on various TV shows. In 1983, he actually secured his own self-titled chat show where he got close up and personal with some of the biggest names in comedy in both Britain and around the world. This series remains notable for many reasons. First, it featured one of the last known recorded interviews with the legendary Tommy Cooper. And then the British television debut of Jim Carrey. So to straddle both ends of the comedy spectrum was no easy feat. But they all shared a vital common ground, that they all loved Bob. And that was enough to make the show work. I'm sadly too young to have been around when this aired. But from what I've read about the series, I'd have really loved it. Instead, the first time I actually remember seeing Bob Monkhouse was in 1993, when he stood in for Chris Evans on The Big Breakfast, alongside the great Gabby Roslin. It's a bit of a shame that I should have discovered him in this way, as I later learned, when he was a guest on Room 101, that he wasn't at all keen on the show. Talking to Bob's writer, Colin Edmonds, he told me that they got up very early to have a sneak peek at the morning's papers before formulating some topical jokes around what was happening so that every show was up to date. As a meticulous comic, he always seeked to have some bespoke material relevant to whatever gig he was doing. And if that meant getting up at 4am to write some material, then that's what he did. It didn't matter if it was the big breakfast or a Friday night at the Bournemouth Pavilion. He was determined to make every show and every TV appearance different from the last. Obviously, at this point, I had no idea about Monkhouse's significant standing in the pantheon of British comedy or his status as one of Britain's best-loved entertainers. He was just Chris Evans' holiday cover, and that was it. Sorry, Bob, if you're listening somewhere. That's probably more offensive than I thought. Yet this appearance was to change the course of my life. And once I fully understood Monkhouse's formidable contribution to comedy, it made me follow his career to previous uncharted territory. I don't know why, but even from a young age, I realised here was a performer who was passionate about every single aspect of comedy a master and student of hilarity. Bob not only knew how to get laughs, but also wanted to know why certain jokes were funny. Today, this passion has been handed over to people like Jimmy Carr, who's not only interested in writing and delivering comedy, but also how certain words and phrases are funnier than others. He's fascinated by the science of laughter and why it is that we laugh. The legendary Ken Dodd used to frequent his local library, reading a whole host of books and works about laughter and why it is that humans laugh. I think it takes a certain type of comedian to want to understand the theory behind laughter and why it's important. There must be some hidden responsibilities when you're a big comedy star. But this one never gave Bob anything but joy. Frequently, he'd use a visible disguise to get himself into comedy clubs to watch his favourite up-and-coming comics strutting their stuff. Did that so the next time he bumped into them, he could say, I love your new routine about this. In some situations, 
They could only have performed the routine once or twice. But somehow Bob had found a way to make himself aware of it. And for some performers, it was greater than any award. Such a prolific performer, you'd assume, wouldn't have had any trouble composing material alone actually drafted in a team of highly experienced and skilled writers to assist with the sheer volume of material that he would deliver. Everyone has heard of the incredible story of Bob Monkhouse's stolen joke book and the dramatic scenes that followed when he and Peter Pritchard offered a reward of £10,000 for their safe return. I think this would make a great caper movie because it has all the elements of a great drama. Action, jeopardy, conflict and resolution. But this was no fiction. Arguably, this is the most sacred, important and famous joke book in the whole of comedy. With illustrations, categorised subjects in a catalogue style format and over a million jokes. This was so much more than a joke book. It was a gag encyclopaedia. So for this to go missing must have been like losing an arm for Bob. After a disastrous 16 months without Bob's files of funny, Peter Pritchard was handed the books by a man asking for a five-figure sum, which gave this legendary story its happy ending. Obviously, this story has since become part of British comedy folklore and was just extraordinary by its dramatic twists and turns. But I feel it represents how truly profound Monkhouse's contribution to entertainment really was. There are many performers throughout history who have been prolific writers in their own right, but very few who were so diligent and passionate about their art. So when people realised that the Monkhouse joke book was missing, it wasn't just a joke book. It was a form of cultural vandalism. This book combined more than 25 years of work, including fully scripted jokes and ideas for sketches and plays. If the pages could talk, it could probably narrate the story of British post-war comedy. So it angers me greatly why anyone would want to steal it. I'm now about to reveal three things that not many people know about Monkhouse. And if you're anything like me, it's got the potential to blow your mind. The first is that Bob Monkhouse's joke book isn't just one book. There are actually a staggering 17 volumes. That's 17 thick binders of jokes all categorised into coloured-coded alphabetical subjects so it made it easier for him to locate the right material for the right gigs. So if he had a gig in Bristol and needed some local material, he went to the letter B, found Bristol, and then was able to formulate a routine based on the few gags that were written on the subject. A flawless concept. The second one is that the books didn't just benefit Monkhouse, but also those around him. As a benevolent and generous performer, Bob was happy to share material with his peers on the circuit. It's said that when he was hosting Sunday Night at the Palladium in 1969, he would happily give fellow comedians a line or two if they were struggling to complete their act. Legend has it that on certain variety bills in the 1960s, Bob would provide almost every comedian with additional material so that he was actually contributing to 95% of the comedy output. Other performers would see this as giving away their own work, which they'd sweated and slaved over. And why should they donate it to someone that would be considered a rival? But Bob didn't see it like this because he just loved comedy and had a passion for the sound of laughter. And it doesn't matter who's delivering it. If the audience was laughing, he was happy. The third is probably something harder to believe in today's 360 content landscape when the role of a gag writer is someone consigned to history. These books were the amalgamation of material obviously from Bob but also his various writers over the years 
because when you wrote for Monkhouse, you were exclusively writing for him and contributing to this wonderful joke encyclopedia. Yet Monkhouse was anything but an old-fashioned, wavering entertainer, a talented and prolific writer himself. Bob needed no assistance in creativity, but the sheer volume of such material demanded him to assemble a company of some of the best comic minds in the business. I imagine writing for Bob Monkhouse was incredibly difficult, because you probably always held something in the back of your head that thought that whatever you were writing, he could probably phrase it better or order a particular joke in a better way. After all, it's important to remember that his passion as a boy was for cartoon. As a prolific sketcher in his own right, Bob spent many hours drooling and making comic strips similar to the ones that he would read in The Beano and Dandy. He even contributed material to the early versions of the magazine, which became his first foray into entertainment. These strips gradually took on an extra comedic edge and inspired by his comedy hero, Max Miller, they became almost like perfectly formed gags, something which would come in useful for the next chapter of his career. It wasn't long before these simple drawings took on an extra comedic approach and suddenly Bob was writing fully functioning gags with a setup and a punchline. If he could do this in comic strip form, maybe the material could work on its own. Aged 17, Monkhouse joined Gaumont British Films as an animator under the supervision of cartoonist David Lowe. It was here that Bob first met his hero, Max Miller, and fell in love with the way he addressed his audience. Miller broke down the obvious social barriers by simply speaking their language and making his material relevant for the time. As soon as he entered the stage, heralding his infamous catchphrase, Listen, listen! The crowd were in the palm of his hand. Bob saw this overwhelming affection which the audience held for his comedy hero and wanted so desperately to emulate it. He approached Miller and showed him the joke book. The comic was so impressed by the standard of Bob's material that he offered to buy a few from him. Thus began the long pursuit of tempting other comics to purchase gags from the Monkhouse repertoire, something which would grow increasingly more frequent as the years went by. Imagine the price of those jokes now including inflation. This eventually resulted in his early career as a joke writer following contributing material to his hero, Bob Hope. Nowadays, it's easy to forget how big a star Hope was in the 40s and 50s. And I think to have someone of that calibre give you his seal of approval must have been like the ultimate accolade. So as a writer, Bob was obviously making waves. But in the 1950s was also a golden era to be a performer away from the depression and devastation of post-war Britain. But comedy writers were still yet to be recognised as workers in their own right. Young comic turned agent Dabba Davis had spotted a 19-year-old RAF serviceman at the Nuffield Centre, the home of the Entertainment Corps within the RAF during the young Bob Monkhouse's spell of national service in 1947. This was the start of claiming rights for scriptwriters that had always gone under the radar. But Bob actually saw a huge value in the material that he and Goodwin were writing and as it evolved, he wanted to obtain ownership over the material he created. I had the absolute honour to interview the late, great Dabba Davis about ten years ago. And he told me that once the agency had begun, they were inundated with writers and indeed performers who were looking for their fair representation. So without Bob, the television script writer may never have been celebrated or credited in the way that they are in today's entertainment landscape. I think you can't overlook his contribution to this. This was an era 
of nightclub review and theatres, including The Windmill, played host to adult shows when nudity was high on the performance agenda. Comics were hired as a light interlude to the frank titillation of the young girls, who it said would frequently parade around the stage naked. It was a tough grounding for any aspiring comedian, and for Bob it was a rude awakening to a life under the spotlight. Yet this was a great opening for any young aspiring performer who had their sights firmly set on a career in variety and the roll call of comics who made their name in the infamous windmill reads like a who's who of British comedy. Benny Hill, Bruce Forsyth, Frankie Howard, Barry Cryer, Tommy Cooper and many more. It was clear that Monkhouse was definitely in good company. This was where British comedy really came of age and Monkhouse was at the very epicentre of it. Admittedly, the windmill remains frequently the subject of controversy over the representation of naked women. And I'm not even about to address that debate. However, if you were a budding comedian in the 1950s, then the windmill was the place to be. It definitely wasn't a walk in the park. Six shows per day, six days per week, gave Bob the ultimate schooling. Appearing alongside fellow future comedian royalty, including Tony Hancock, Frankie Howard, Bruce Forsyth, and the little unknown duo called Morecambe and Wise, gave Bob the opportunity to flex his comedy muscles. But personally, what I think set him apart from his peers was his ability to pause and analyse people and situations as they were happening. His analytical mind made him want to understand and appreciate what made other performers tick. By their very nature, comedians are extremely unique individuals with a particular view of the world. They are ardent exhibitionists who thrive on a stage, but the moment they come off, they seek that drug of laughter and find it incredibly difficult to cope without it. Thankfully, Bob always knew how to control this through a healthy work-life balance. But he still witnessed many of his peers fall victim to the inescapable reality. Yet, the sacrifices that these entertainers made in the name of comedy led to the start of a golden era of British light entertainment For the first time ever, both theatrical impressionists and TV executives saw the potential in upscaling this brand for entertainment for mass audiences. Of course, at this time, nobody had a clue how absolutely revolutionary it was. But why would they? Comedy had never been showcased on such a national scale before. And this generation were the pioneers. But Bob's precise analytical recounting of this period provided some evidence to suggest that he had some idea of the magnitude of what was happening. It's an interesting thought, and I guess we'll never know. But I wonder if there was something Machiavellian about his approach to comedy. Monkhouse was a visionary, both in his attitude to comedy and pushing the boundaries of television. Unlike many of his peers... He was never afraid of the medium and instead wanted to use it to its fullest potential. This made him an obvious choice to front the ATV prank series Candid Camera. In 1960, where he presided over members of the public who were unsuspecting subjects of elaborate pranks. Over 20 years before Jeremy Beadle, this was the first time that television had been used to make the audience its stars of the show. Yet it was the art of recording which was to ignite Bob's imagination, which would ultimately transcend Bob's work to become a hobby. Whether it was a clever joke written down on paper or the recording of one of his favourite performers, this method proved very important to him until the day he died. While television made him a star, it was Monkhouse's stand-up and cabaret performances which endeared him to his fellow performers. It's become a cliché, but it was by his very nature a comedian's comedian, always caring about crafting a gag in the right way and knowing just by changing a word he could turn a joke 
from a little titter to a belly laugh. On simply seeing jokes on the page, he knew instinctively what material would be funny and understood the significance between the difference of a good joke and whether it would get a laugh. As an accomplished writer himself, Monkhouse not just understood, but mastered the art of verbal dexterity and was so equipped for the unrivalled nose for comedy. Therefore, while writers like the great Colin Edmonds, John Junkin and Jez Stevenson were absolutely crucial to his longevity and popularity, there was very little that he couldn't do himself. This is the unique thing about Bob Monkhouse. His output was prolific. Nowadays, comedians can take up to five years to produce a new stand-up tour, which might last three months before doing a TV series or a reality show and then starting the process again. Yet Bob and his writers were creating material like a factory. And it was also an extremely high standard. Whether it was delivering a few topical gags at the start and the end of a family television show, or filling the theatre full of punters, he had the unique ability to take extraordinary care of every joke, every line, and every laughter he ever created. It's difficult to think of another performer who had the ability to juggle a successful live act alongside being one of the most popular television personalities of his generation. If he'd been around today, he would definitely have been playing the O2 and had more than enough talent and ability to be a one-man band. Over the years, Monkhouse became known to millions of viewers as the unrivaled king of comedy game shows. Yet, this was only half the story. Like most entertainers, laughter was a drug that satisfied Bob, and as long as the audience were happy laughing, he was happy. Blessed with an extraordinary unique style of delivery, he thrived on the ability to play around with language and inference. Sometimes he would only have to allude to a punchline and the audience would start to laugh. Like all great comedians, he understood that half the time it wasn't what he said that would get the laugh, but what he wouldn't. It's difficult to think of many performers who have such complex relationships with their audience. It's very difficult to stand on stage and tell jokes, which makes an audience laugh out loud. But that's not what Bob did. He took subjects and developed them so that the audience thought they knew where he was going. But then at the last moment, he would veer off to an area where you didn't see it coming. And for an audience, that's absolutely beautiful. It may look easy, but my God, it's not. The poise... The composure, the confidence of knowing you're in full command of the crowd in order to exploit the false sense of security that you've created. Now that's magic. Other than possibly Tommy Cooper's doctor's jokes, all of my favourite one-liners come courtesy of Mr Monkhouse. Every time I hear the line, I'm still having sex at 75, it makes me absolutely howl with laughter because I know what's coming. I live at 76, so it's no distance. It's such a simple joke, which essentially juxtaposes age with house numbers, but with his precise delivery and utter stupidity of the concept, it just makes me laugh every single time I hear it. There's nothing clever or intellectual about it. It's incredibly silly and juvenile. But I think that's why it appeals to me so much. The thought of this ageing man attempting to have his end away with some floozy down the road. It just paints such a vivid picture in my head. And that's what's funny. That was the utter genius of Monkhouse. He just knew how to create vibrant images in your head and could play around with them for comic effect. The other routine that he did, which always makes me laugh, is about dogs. Don't you hate it when dogs stick their faces in your crutch and wave them around? But of course, little dogs, you have to lay on the ground for them to do it. I think it's his mannerisms and facial expressions that makes this joke work, because despite being a comic, there's always something 
authoritarian about Monkhouse, and to think of him getting on the ground to let a dog lick his crutch was such a hilarious idea. Again, such a simple joke, entirely based upon imagery, which had you laughing throughout the routine, sometimes merely because of a pause or the use of a particular word or phrase. However, it wasn't just one-liners that packed a punch. The story about him getting home from the airport is just perfect. He'd been away on business and was really looking forward to seeing his wife. When he unlocked the front door, he got butterflies in his stomach at the thought of seeing her. On opening the door, there was a path of objects leading him up the stairs to his bedroom. As he opened the bedroom door, he saw his wife handcuffed to the headboard, looking windswept, to which he said, We've been learning some naughty tricks, haven't we? To which she replied, We've been burgled, you stupid bastard! Well, it doesn't get much better than that. The setup to the joke was so carefully crafted, like a painting, which, for a moment, makes you think that this isn't a joke at all. It might purely be a sentimental dedication to the lovely Jackie, who was more often than not the butt of his jokes. But then he subverts it with a killer punchline, which is quick but so effective it's just genius. Some of his material never really needed a punchline because he knew that his audience would always be one step ahead. This allowed him to be slightly more smutty on occasions when he knew he could push it but he was never ever vulgar simply because he didn't need to be. He was far too intelligent and dignified. He knew exactly how far to push his material for the maximum effect. To many, he was a shiny floor game show host to reverse the stereotypes of those cheesy one-liners associated with the genre. He had to be slightly more fruity. One of my favourite Monkhouse one-liners, difference between a solicitor and a superhero. A superhero plucks defiance, whereas a solicitor, he didn't even need to complete the joke, as he knew his audience would be more than intelligent enough to work it out themselves. So having such a great command over an audience, it seems utterly ridiculous that he was criticised by a small section of the comedy community for fronting too many game shows. Even Bob himself may have acknowledged that there may have been some truth in this claim, but... In order to fully appreciate this, it's important to understand what was happening in television entertainment at the time. The late 1960s brought in big changes for television, not only as a result of the dissolution of ATV, the associated rediffusion, which resulted in a television revolution, but also the end of television variety, which ended the career of many a variety stalwart. When Sunday Night at the Palladium closed its doors for the final time in 1969, television had yet to establish a new platform to showcase the entertainers and comedians who shone brightly on that famous stage. TV executives had no idea what to do with this generation of entertainers because for the first time there was no variety for them to fall back on. Up until this point, it was easy for executives to shoehorn comedians into any variety show because they were just produced like any theatrical performance. But when television actually came into its own, executives shat themselves because they thought, oh, what the fuck are we going to do with them? Performers like Monkhouse were just too good to be a star on a pop show of the day. They needed a vehicle of their own, the game show became the most logical format to continue a comedian's TV dominance. And it didn't take Bob long to get to grips with the disciplines of that genre. He approached this like any other comedy show and forever looked for new opportunities to insert a gag. After all, this was light entertainment. And what's light entertainment without comedy? Every rule of the game was another opportunity for a joke. Every contestant was another ally or stooge for a gag. And of course, the shows were always bookended by a monkhouse monologue, which became like a miniature comedy routine. It may have been a sandwich inside a game show format, but Bob was savvy to take advantage of every single opportunity for comedy. After all, that's what he did. While other performers may have been frustrated by this new purpose of his generation of comics, Bob thrived upon the opportunity to showcase his vast comedic talents. 
His slick, sharp delivery was the perfect accompaniment to live alongside the workings of the game. The great Jimmy Tarbuck once told me that the secret to a successful game show is simplicity. And Bob understood the vital importance of this. If it's too complicated, the audience won't invest in it and ultimately won't care if the contestants win or lose. This understanding was also shared by Bob's agent and manager, Peter Pritchard, who began his entertainment career under the supervision of Lou and Leslie Grade. So he realised the value in matching television formats to an individual star. The relationship between Peter Pritchard and Bob Monkhouse would become one of the most successful in entertainment history. Towards the end of the 60s, whilst in America, Pritchard came across a game show entitled Family Feud, where two sets of families battled it out in a series of games based on opinion polls. Sounding familiar? Our survey says... (laughs) As we all know, Family Feud became more recognisable Family Fortunes and became an instant hit for ITV for the next 30 years. However, the amazing creativity, foresight and incredulity of both Monkhouse and Pritchard gave this format its legs. Nowadays, it seems that almost every entertainer has their own production company or content creator, and we're very accustomed to stars being the executive producer. Yet in 1980, It was extremely rare for performers to have autonomy over their own shows. But this was just another example of how Bob was years ahead of his time. A meticulous performer with an exquisite eye for detail. Monkhouse instinctively knew what would work for television. And despite never obtaining a production credit as producer, there was no doubt that he would have made a supreme TV auteur. But Monkhouse was so much more than a game show host. And for anyone merely to use that term to describe his work was to miss the point entirely. In fact, the biggest reason as to why he claimed this prestigious title as master of the game show may have been because of his effortless comedic patter, which became the staple of each and every show he fronted. Slick, yes, Smooth, definitely, but smarmy, never. This was because of the simple reason that beyond his undeniable genius for comedy was also a natural flair for broadcasting, which meant that he could instinctively take care of all the administrative responsibilities that come with the game show format and was remarkably comfortable doing so. As soon as he stepped out in front of an audience, He felt at ease. And while he still suffered with nerves, both his theatrical training and unrivaled preparation never let him down. Nowadays, anyone can be a game show host. Formats are handed out to almost anyone. TV presenters, actors, singers, even dancers have secured their own format. And I doubt it won't be too long before a YouTuber gets an opportunity. Yet throughout the 70s and 80s, the British game show was the intended vehicle for comedy stars and occupied a significant portion of the light entertainment TV output and was treated with the utmost respect by both the audience and TV management. Comedians were the perfect choice to front these shows because they were never stuck for a line or a gag. They knew instinctively when and where not to play on something in order to make the viewing experience for the audience, both in the studio and at home. There was an art form to presiding over a quiz show, which sadly may have been forgotten in this modern era. The actual game was secondary to the hilarious exchanges between the host and contestants. Producers loved these formats because they were very cost-effective for studio time and had very little financial outgoings apart from the prizes. Therefore, multiple episodes could be filmed in a day, which would give network enough content for a week's worth of programming. For legendary performers like Bob, this could be extremely lucrative and the working hours were sociable. 
What wasn't there to like? Monkhouse did extremely well out of the game show format, but not without its fair share of criticism. The Golden Shot, Family Fortunes, Celebrity Squares, Bob's Full House, Bob's Your Uncle, The $64,000 Question, Monkhouse's Memory Masters, and not forgetting Wipeout. Bob presided over an unprecedented number of game shows, both for BBC and ITV, spanning over four decades. Forever the master of self-deprecation, this would form a regular part of his live comedy act when he would end with a line, Look at me with some respect. I've been able to get away with substantial amounts of crap on British television. But of course, the irony is that in the hands of Bob, no TV was ever crap, simply because he was master, the OG number one. In my opinion, no one has ever chaired a game show in the slick and smooth way as Monkhouse. No one's ever understood the intrinsic purpose of a TV game show either as well or as comprehensively as he. He was born to thrive in front of a studio audience and these shows allowed him to do just that. Apart from Beat the Clock at the Palladium and Huey Green's Double Your Money, before Bob, television had yet to make the game show its own. In such primitive years for the new medium, television had little idea of the impact that stars and shows would have upon the watching audience. Yet as soon as Bob made an appearance on television, he was there to stay. And being one of the only entertainers to fully grasp this new medium, his popularity soared and never seemed to wane. Always moving with the times and embracing new stars, styles of comedy and attitudes to TV, Bob was relevant for every generation simply because he absolutely loved it. Smart enough to understand the fashions of comedy and talented enough to be able to stay relevant to them while staying true to his slick, sharp patter, which his audience adored him for. Monkhouse was the man of all seasons. Thankfully, during the 90s, Monkhouse was able to step out from his game show shadow and remind both audiences and TV execs that he was so much more than just a two-dimensional television host. In the early 90s, Bob was invited to be a guest on the satirical Judgment, Have I Got News For You. In 1994, the heavyweight panel show was reserved for the sharpest minds on the alternative comedy circuit, and the figures of Bob's generation were frequently the subject of Merton and Hislop's acerbic commentary. So Bob's appearance on the show may have been a bit of a gamble for the now veteran entertainer. But of course, we're talking about one of the sharpest minds to ever grace British comedy. So he obviously had no problem with keeping up with the sharp patter of contemporary satire. This appearance reintroduced Bob to the comedy elite. But I have to ask, why was it ever in doubt? Here was a guy who collaborated with the majority of the funniest people of the 20th century. So a panel show would surely be a walk in the park. As a new millennium dawned, Monkhouse had rightfully earned his legendary status within the annals of British comedy. In 2001, it was revealed that he was undergoing treatment for prostate cancer, which he took just like any other aspect of his life by incorporating it into his stand-up routine. In 2003, just months before his death, Bob turned his hand to documentary making when he told the unabridged story of British comedy through the eyes of its biggest stars. This was unlike anything I'd ever seen before and was brave enough to reveal some dark secrets of showbiz past. In the hands of any other star, such a documentary would have the potential to be a little superficial and phony. After all, 
It was taking quite a brutally honest glance at historical events from British Light Entertainment in an unbiased and factual manner. This wasn't your normal retrospective nostalgic TV documentary. It was looking at the stories that we all knew, but through the eyes of performers who'd lived through it. Bob Monkhouse, behind the laughter, proved one of his last TV vehicles. But it almost seemed a fitting way for him to bow out by fronting a documentary which was so passionate. Twenty years on, this remains my favourite factual documentary ever. As we all know, the 27th of December 2003 shall forever be a dark day for British comedy. I distinctly remember waking up early because I had the dentist and my dad turned the BBC breakfast on to reveal the sad news. Those images of him at the Royal Variety just 30 months previously now took on an extra significance as for many. This was the last time they ever saw him doing what he did best. People like him don't retire. It would be utterly pointless because TV execs would forever be enticing him back for one-man shows, specials and retrospective interviews. So there was never even scope for retirement and he worked right until the end simply because he loved what he did. Indeed, his last professional gig came out just weeks before he died, when he personally invited an audience of his favourite comedians to the cellar bar in the Albany pub in central London, where they were treated to an exclusive routine courtesy of the man himself. Such a high-profile public figure like Bob is always going to create speculation about his health, especially when he'd revealed his cancer diagnosis in 2001. He was one of the most famous and revered figures in the country. So his illness had been well documented throughout the media, including a very intimate interview with his great friend Michael Parkinson. Yet he made a huge effort to play it down and continued to work regardless. Comedy was in his blood. And he didn't know anything else. So that's what kept him going. It takes a brave performer to want to purposefully entertain an audience of fellow comedians who are all there to watch you, coupled with the fact that, by this time, he wasn't a well man. It seemed absolutely miraculous that he was able to deliver a flawless 90-minute stand-up set. It's just unbelievable. This was very different from his 1994 LWT and audience with. This was more rustic and embryonic, with an audience made solely of up-and-coming comedians who he greatly admired. It was Monkhouse's career swan song and he wanted to do it in the same style as the rest of his career, by giving a platform to the comedy stars of tomorrow. This night has gone down in British comedy history as one of the all-time greats signed off style. What a brilliant, fitting way to end one of the most successful careers in all of British light entertainment. 75 is no early age to die in today's society when medical advancements continue to defy the odds and giving a lifeline to so many people. Yet Bob Monkhouse crammed so much into his 75 years on earth and the British comedy community shall forever be richer for it. So in this podcast, I just wanted to convey how very important he was to almost every aspect of light entertainment. In the era of the disposable celebrity who comes and goes, just like seasons, Bob Monkhouse was a household name for 50 years and his fame never wavered. For me, 
he was the absolute embodiment of everything I love about comedy. The sharp one-liners, the perfect host, and the hilarious showbiz stories. Having cerebral palsy, I frequently wonder what I would have been if I didn't have a disability, and a stand-up comedian is always at the top of the list. To command an audience with the same poise control as Monkhouse would be so very rewarding. But while I can't perform myself, I can still appreciate great comedy. I could give you a whole series of analytical remarks on Bob's engagement with an audience or his huge significance to the story of British comedy. Yet why is he still remembered over 20 years since his death? Simply because he's the best. Thank you so much for listening to my random ramblings about my comedy hero perfectly delivered by the wonderful Harriet Zorp. And let's keep keeping the Monkhouse legacy alive so that new audiences and new generations can discover this giant of British comedy. Thank you and see you next time.